My name is Anna Hatcher, and I researched indigenous medicine as it is seen in contemporary Western medicine. Getting scientists to consider the validity of indigenous knowledge is like swimming upstream in cold, cold water. This quote by Robin Kimmerer in her book Braiding Sweetgrass had me thinking a lot about why it is so difficult for scientists to validate this knowledge and knowledge of um, indigenous medicine. And I got to thinking that it it seems sensical that Europeans who came and dehumanized indigenous peoples and obviously weren't respecting their way of life, um, it makes sense that they would evolve and develop their own culture that is quite contrary to this belief system. Um, but nevertheless, I knew that some of our medicines and modern pharmaceuticals uh, were products of plant compounds and so I was curious to explore this topic to see what medicines indigenous peoples were known for using and do those medicines show up in our modern day, day pharmaceuticals and is our current use similar to the use that indigenous peoples had. The first plant that I looked at uh, was the willow tree and the willow is found all over the world, so there's a lot of history of indigenous peoples using the willow tree. Oftentimes, uh, the bark would be boiled for tea, or people would chew on the leaves, and this was to reduce pain, such as toothaches or headaches and arthritis. Also, the wood was really useful in constructing shelters, cradle boards, basket weaving, and as spiritual protection. As far as our current and Western medicinal use, in the 1800s, salicylic acid, which is the compound found in the bark, was first isolated. And in the 1850s, it was synthesized, although this rendered a product that was largely irritable to the stomach. And so it wasn't until the 1890s that Bayer created its final product, which we now know as aspirin. And aspirin is actually so important now that the World Health Organization's uh, list, it is listed on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines and is also one of the most prevalent home ph pharmaceuticals in the developed world. And coincidentally, we use it for many of the similar things and um, it's used to reduce fever, reduce mild and moderate pains, like toothaches, headaches, and arthritis. I then wanted to look into the coneflower, um, just because I've heard a lot about it being used, but didn't know all that much about it. Um, so the coneflower, there's a couple different species, and um, they have been historically used to treat infections, wounds, diseases such as smallpox and mumps, and as an antidote against poisons like snake bites. And they've been used to boost the immune system during colds, so kind of a wide um, spread of uses for echinacea, which is also uh, a name you might know it by. But for example, the Cheyenne used it to treat common colds, the Pawnee used it to relieve headaches, and the Lakota used it to relieve other pains. Um, and I found this quite interesting. They wrote in particular to Echinacea, uh, they believe that indigenous peoples learned of its medicinal use by observing wounded elk eat the Echinacea flowers. And um, they then gained that knowledge by observing the animals and learned of its medicinal properties. As far as Western medicinal use, it is, to my knowledge, not used in any clinical pharmaceuticals, but it is the most common, one of the most common botanical medicines used in the United States, pre uh, predominantly for immune support. Um, and they have done research with echinacea and seen that it does increase the white blood cell uh, development, and so it is effectively fighting off bacteria or viruses that are causing the common cold. But a lot of research has been done with echinacea um, with kind of inconsistent results, which may be um, due to the varying species and also varying plant parts. But they found that there are properties, a long list of properties. Um, as you can see there, there's yeah a lot of potential for the use of echinacea. Um, but Currently, the primary research being done is, is on its potential use for respiratory tract infections. Um, and it is also in, in research with the herpes simplex virus, influenza, and respiratory virus. Uh, it did seriously suppress the development of these viruses. And so this had me thinking with our current situation, potentially echinacea flowers or 
depending on the part of the plant, but echinacea could be used uh, to treat COVID-19, potentially. That's coming from me, no <laughs> scientist. And then I looked at the Pacific yew tree. Excuse me if I, for, if I mispronounce this, but the Chihalas people would bathe their infants and elderly in water that was soaked with yew leaves to encourage perspiration and improve their physical well-being. And the Klalem would make tea and drink it to soothe internal injuries and pains. And the Cowlitz people would grind the leaves and apply pulp to wounds. And it was also, like the willow, uh, widely used to make other things like bows and arrows, fishing harpoons, cutlery, dishware, and other things. Um, as far as Western medicinal use, in 1962, the United States Department of Agriculture contracted researchers to find plants that may have potential for curing cancers, and they found that the bark of the yew tree possessed cytotoxic properties. Um, in 1977, they confirmed that it had huge potential for anti-tumor medications, and it was particularly effective against ovarian cancer. This led to the development of Taxol, um, which is the best-selling cancer drug worldwide. Um, yeah, and it is used to treat breast, lung, kaposi, sarcoma, cervical, and pancreatic cancers, among others. And the last plant I looked at is the cinchona tree. It is traditionally used by the Quechua people of Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador. And they use this bark to treat hypothermia, fever, infections, inflammation, and pain. And it is said that there was a puddle of water by a tree and the gentleman drank from the water and it was incredibly bitter and this became known as the first tonic water ever discovered. Uh, in the 1600s, the missionaries that were living in Peru knew of the indigenous uses of cinchona bark to treat fevers and they began treating malaria patients that were exhibiting fevers and it miraculously worked wonders. And in, um, in the 1820s, quinine, which is the active ingredient of um, the malaria, anti-malaria medication, it was first extracted and isolated, and still to this day, quinine is the most effective medicine against malaria. They have developed other medications, and the mosquitoes that transmit malaria tend to build up resistance to those other medic medications. So it's quite significant that still to this day, quinine is the most effective treatment. And it also is now currently one of um, the main ingredients of tonic water. A big discovery from the research that I conducted is that natural products and their derivatives account for over 50% of pharmaceutical drugs in current clinical use. So that would include plants and fungi and bacteria and anything else found in nature. And I thought that this was particularly interesting because there certainly does seem to be a sig stigma in the United States about natural medicines and plant-based medicines. And despite that stigma, natural medicines are really prevalent in our pharmaceutical clinical use. Also, uh, especially with the cone flower, we could see we can see that plant-based compounds can provide expansive treatments to many ailments that humans may come across. And I'm a personal believer that uh, for any ailment that we might develop, develop, there's likely something in nature that has evolved over the hundreds of thousands of millions of years uh, to support that life on Earth and maintain its health and balance in, in nature. The other big takeaway of this research is realizing that a lot of the indigenous uses of these medicines do co correlate with our current uses of these medicines. So scientists, I think, carry this stigma because traditional medicine wasn't learned through clinical research, but was instead learned through thousands of years of evolution and from learning from animals and from passing on this information through generations. And I think that scientists tend to um, discredit that way of knowing, but I personally find that that seems to be a more efficable way of knowing by listening and looking to nature and seeing that 
these plants have evolved with other beings over hundreds of thousands of years. And this information in this story has been passed along for good reason. And I think that just goes to conclude something that I know I'm reminded of time and time again in my life and something that I think we should all pay a little more attention to, and that is that I think nature often knows best.